So I thought it'd be a, a good time to get back out in the garden. The last time we were out here was, I believe, May. And uh, so it's been, been a number of months. Uh, I planted this tree in, in a previous video, so you can see it when it was planted. What was that now? I, I think five months ago. It's basically doubled in size, and I'm gonna take some credit for just having a good summer because it was brutal all summer. Uh, we had one of the worst summers here in Phoenix from a heat perspective in decades. More days above 110 degrees than I think we have had in the, in the time that they've been taking measure. Uh, keeping all these younger trees healthy in that time was a lot of work. I was working on, I was out here every day, uh, you know, working on, on the trees. Uh, so this is a Pakistani mulberry. Uh, before I get too far, I wanted to address a couple things that have been mentioned about this tree. Mulberry trees are an allergen if they're the male version. So uh, there, are, there are male and female trees. Some trees are both male and female. Uh, but this, this is a female Pakistani mulberry. So it doesn't put out pollen it does put out fruit. So this, this one is not the allergen variety. And because these trees grow very well in this climate, um, this particular one is self-pollinating. So it doesn't require a male to pollinate, but even if it did, there are plenty of male mulberry trees in the vicinity around. These are trees that you'll see if you go to like our local riparian preserve, you will see mesquite trees and you'll see mulberry trees growing natively. Uh, so this one in particular, it's the Pakistani variety. It puts out fruit that are about two inches long and they're really sweet. Uh, they're my favorite version of a mulberry. I added uh, just this weekend a couple more to this, this little habitat zone. Uh, this is a new grapefruit tree that I put in. And uh, this, is a, this is a Valencia orange. Uh, so. I was doing the math and I think I have up to 12 citrus trees on site now. We have blood orange, Valencia's, navels, we have lemon, uh, several, several different lemon trees. We have limes over there. Uh, we have a tangerine, a mandarin, a kumquat, and then there's multiple varieties. So there's eight different types of citrus and then there's multiple trees of some of them. So I think I'm up to 12 on the citrus end. When we first bought this property, there was six big orange trees. One of them just, one of them did not make it through the summer this year. And I've been noticing that the really old ones, the mature ones, they seem to be kind of at their end of life. They're, they're around 85, 90 from what I've been told. And uh, this is around the end of life for, for an orange tree. Uh, what I've been seeing in my bigger ones, which really were not very well maintained during the first couple of years of the bakery, maybe that's why they're all not doing so well now, they seem to put out one last good fruiting and then they die. So the, the best fruit I ever got from this big uh, orange tree was this past year and then it's like it, it fruited and then then died right away. I expect that this mulberry tree will do better after I added all of this other life around it. It was the only thing in this section for a while. It was an island of, of mulch, but anywhere where there's heavy mulch, uh, there is, there's also been uh, increasing life in the soil. So, um, so the whole idea here is to invest in, in kind of the microbiome of, of our yard. And I'm not really seeing much right now, um, but there's other parts of the yard that are, that are significantly more robust than this. I think it's partially because this has been such an island on its own, but I've already noticed in other areas that I have mulch where if I grab a handful, it's just teeming with life. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going for. Uh, 
I've been looking at other people that that have fruit forests in their Phoenix properties and typically mulch is really important. It, it retains humidity and moisture on the ground and uh, is full of composters, um, different, different uh, bugs and worms that, that, uh, that help uh, create rich soil. This all sort of recycles and works together. This is, but this is really the start of a system. So we have, I think 45 or so fruit trees right now on the property. And you'd think that that's a lot, but it's actually just the base layer of what will all work together. So when I watered the mulberry tree, underneath all this mulch are basically runoffs to the other two citrus trees that I planted. So the same amount of water that I was basically dispensing for the mulberry tree is now plant, now watering three trees instead of one. Uh, and it's easier now to control moisture when you have a larger area. Um, as these trees mature and as kind of they recycle their own leaves, the soil benefits from it. So this is sort of the start of a micro habitat. This is one and then there's a bunch of micro habitats around where the other fruit trees are in the in the property, but they will all sort of combine into one giant microhabitat over time. So right now there's a bunch of little islands that will become a whole uh, over time. And this is still a very young system, but if you do look, um, look at some of the people that have been doing this for a while, there's like desert around their yard and then they're, they just have a, a huge forest of life uh, on their property. And, Phoenix is supportive of this. This is a fig that I planted. When I planted it, it was just these three stems. These older leaves are now about to drop and feed the soil below, but all of this undergrowth, uh, which is part of like the multi-trunk system of a fig, it's kind of like growing almost like a bush. This is all new growth that, that happened over the summer. Uh, this loquat tree is a little bit more of a challenge to grow. Um, especially given that it's so exposed right now. Um, so these were all covered with shade cloth in the summer, but when I first got it, it was just this one bloom, which was half of that. And so it's gotten all these new leaves. It's also doing very well. Uh, so, and then I have a ton in the back. The smallest and least mighty will become one of the mightiest trees. This is a Moringa tree. Uh, so this will be one of the last times that I can pick it up. Uh, if, it, if it survives transplant and does well, it will it'll be a giant. Uh, and I'm putting in a pecan tree over here uh, into this spot. I tried one in the spring and it came in this like deeper, uh, deeper pot and I guess I'm still learning how to transplant well. I tried to tip it over like I did with the mulberry tree and I just destroyed all the roots so it didn't survive. So this time I'm gonna cut the pot out while it's already at, you know, in the hole when I plant it. And this pecan will essentially replace the dead orange tree that's right here and form a three tree system right here which will one day merge with this. So. The whole idea in a few years is this will be a forest um, and then I won't have to worry about neighbors anymore because they won't be able to even see my house. Uh, so I figure that will that'll help me in the long run. Uh, but that's basically the garden update. Um, it's a little bit rough around the edges right now because we're putting in a lot of new stuff. So you can see bags laying around of mulch. There's a big pine tree that's going in it's gonna match some of the giant pines that are, we already have two that are the tallest trees on our property, so I'm excited about that. Um, but this, this whole yard is going to ultimately feed our new bakery. My goal is to have fruit production through much of the year 
and I hope that all of that fruit is going down to Main Street and Mesa and being used in the bakery, being used in baked goods. And then I hope that once we move the bakery out of here, we can start getting our, our community more involved with, uh, with growing these edible landscapes. Uh, one of the reasons I'm focused on that here is that we in this neighborhood have flood irrigation, uh, which I'm still tapping into. A previous owner of this house cemented over our flood irrigation valve, but this is basically water that comes from our, our canal system, which is derived from uh, the White Mountains, which uh, yeah, people think that Arizona is like this dead desert, but it's not. Actually, Phoenix was a floodplain historically. Uh, a lot of our water is coming from uh, snow melt uh, in the White Mountains. Uh, and, and so that's being fed uh, through a series of dams into a canal system. And we have the ability to grab that irrigation canal water and flood our whole property, which you can do that up to once every two weeks just about, which for a lot of these trees, that's all that they need is just that one deep soaking uh, you know, every, every couple weeks. Uh, and the nice thing about the irrigation water is because there's fish and all that in the water that it's got natural fertilizer in it. So we have these flood irrigation valves because this all used to be a citrus grove. And uh, I think that a great way of increasing biodiversity in this area um, and increasing our own self-sufficiency would be to substitute some of these ornamental landscapes for edible ones. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with ornamentals, but uh, there's so many fruit trees that grow well here uh, and so many edibles that grow well here. The rosemary that uh, we use in the bakery for our salted rosemary twists, I just put a new rosemary bush because I figure that our one rosemary bush will no longer be able to sustain uh, the the whole of the bakery much longer. This is what we clip for our salted rosemary twist. We come in here and we grab this amount for about a week. And in in a week's growth, I mean, it's replacing the majority of that in new growth. Uh, and it's growing faster and faster because it's getting bigger. So uh, with two more bushes coming, because I got another little guy by the Moringa, I think we'll still be covered on rosemary. This requires almost no water. Uh, it works really well here. I neglected this plant uh, two years ago when I first put it in. I really only started taking care of it at the same time that I put in all these other trees. So uh, for us, this is a big part of what we are trying to do. Um, and it's not something that I'm strong in. So don't take this as like some sort of an instructional of this is how you are to garden. I'm still learning like anyone else, but I think that it's an important skill to take on. For me, since I work in food, I want to understand how food is grown. Um, and I think that this is my way of learning about um, learning about how to create life uh, in, in a biological sense. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in continuing this uh, journey, whether or not uh, we can keep the bakery here. So uh, the bakery is right here behind these walls. Uh, once we move into our new home in downtown Mesa, we will essentially still keep a cottage set up here. So we'll downscale from uh, the setup for the whole bakery. Uh, and we will probably use this for some classes. We'll definitely use this for my daughter's uh, uh, cookie thing that she's been doing, her cookie business. Um, but it will not go to waste. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. As a final piece of the garden, I'll show you, this is going to be a huge hedge of pineapple guava. This is also a fruiting bush. Uh, it's meant to be a screen for our, our trash cans, which it's still got a ways to go to be truly functional there. But I noticed that a mesquite tree had planted itself here. Uh, this is one of kind of the trees that natively grows in our climate. And I was wondering whether I should uproot this mesquite tree, given that it's in the middle of a giant hedge of bushes that's going to end up being a wall here. But I decided to preserve this mesquite tree 
it will provide a canopy over this hedge and mesquite trees have these well they have these edible po uh, seeds these pods um, they're like a legume basically you can bake with them but more importantly they are nitrogen fixers they're really good for the soil so when they drop all of their seeds uh, that's just pure nutrition for the soil below it so I figured to kind of close the loop on this particular island which will always remain an island it's got concrete around it so it's not really as well connected to the rest of the the landscape here I figured that the mesquite tree would be uh, would be kind of a good foundation for it all. And even though it's the tiniest right now, it's going to grow faster than all the stuff around it because it's very native and it doesn't, like all the water it's getting when I water all these trees is more than it typically gets. Uh, this is a plum tree actually here. And you can see the effects of our summer. So this one also got planted in the spring and our summer heat just crisped up these leaves even though there was even more shade cloth around it in the summer i've learned that it's good to keep these burned leaves i think a lot of people would be tempted to pick them all off uh, but apparently uh, the the burnt leaves uh, are still connected to the tree i mean this is still a living leaf and they're sending signals to the tree that hey uh the the leaf that you put out wasn't strong enough uh, for the home that I'm living in, so put out a stronger leaf. So these newer leaves, because of the burnt leaves that are still here, these newer leaves are going to be stronger and the tree will slowly adapt to the climate that it's in. A plum tree by default would have appreciated a slightly colder climate, but it's going to do well here because this is a fairly well protected spot. Um, as far as shade, these pineapple guava will grow around it and provide uh, shade protection uh, naturally over time. So this is kind of a work in progress. Our, our landscape here will not be complete for years to come and it will be a fun thing that continues to be a part of our lifestyle. Um, I'll segue into the bakery a little bit and just show uh, again what we were aiming for here. We planted a hedge uh, of trees around our cruise vehicles uh, so that they could park and not really be visible to our neighbors. Uh, this area was designed so that my truck could tuck all the way behind this wall and put a gate and I was hoping that I could get away with it, but now we only bring it in um, for temporary moments, uh, typically only on Fridays. This is a little bit exceptional that it's still here, but at this point we are being forced out of here and being kicked out in the next couple months. And so I don't really see much of what my neighbor can do in addition to what's already been done. We're already facing a quarter million dollars of a move and I just don't see much in more imposition that the neighbor can cost us. So if the truck is moving a day later this week, I think we'll be okay. I'm starting to turn the page and, and focus on the future. There's no sense in focusing on the past. At this point, we are, are knees deep in our new project. Uh, and so it's, it's time to focus on this space as like a supplement to the business in the sense that you know, it's going to be producing thousands of pounds of fruit per year, which we'll be using in the bakery. And that's exciting enough, uh, you know, for me. Uh, if that was all that this space was ever known for, I think that it would be good enough. Uh, but the fact that it sort of spawned what will be a really awesome community bakery for years to come uh, I'm proud of what we've been able to do uh, here on our one third of an acre in the suburbs of Phoenix. Uh, and, and I encourage those of you that, that live in areas where you have a resource like a, like a home uh, that's 
not being fully utilized, uh, where you have extra power, where you have extra space in the form of your garage and, and where you can legally start to create new things and create new entrepreneurial ideas. I, I think you'd be in good company if you started a garage-based business. Um, there's, there's plenty of examples of companies that we use every day uh, that started in garages. So this was an example of that and, and we have to move on. But um, the legacy of the property will still end up feeding and nourishing the, the bakery as a whole. So uh, excited. But here's the garden update. I think the next time we come back here, you'll see even more trees and more growth uh, from the ones that have come in.